Right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Martin Hilditch. I'm the Deputy Editor of Inside Housing, and I'd like you to welcome you all to this fire and safety uh, gas safety webinar. The aim of this hour-long session, supported by partnership organisation Door Risk Advisors, is to provide practical advice and information to landlords about how they should assess fire risk in their homes and maintain and improve properties effectively and safely. It will look at what the fire service regards as best practice, as well as what some leading landlords have been doing to improve the fire and gas safety of their homes. To help us do this, we've got a fantastic panel of experts who will be sharing their experience with us this morning. Our first speaker will be Nick Coombe, Head of Fire Safety with London Fire Brigade, who will be passing on his expectations as a social landlord and tips about how they can improve performance. Next up is Nick Cross, Head of Housing Management with Southampton City Council. He'll be sharing the Council's approach to fire safety and learning picked up from a fire in one of its tower blocks last year in which two firefighters tragically lost their lives. Our third speaker is Michael Vickers, Senior Investment Manager at Liverpool Mutual Homes. Michael has kindly stepped in as a replacement for his colleague Dave Woods, who's ill today. Um, LMH has built a reputation for its work in the field of um, uh, fire and gas safety. Um, Michael will be sharing information about his approach um, to both this morning. Our final speaker today is Graham Fieldhouse, a consultant who specialises in fire safety and social housing. Graham will be sharing his years of experience in the field and talking us through the areas he feels landlords should be paying more attention to in order to fulfil their responsibilities and make their homes safer. As many of you will be aware, um, Inside Housing um, has a track record in this field too, um, uh, running a successful fire and gas safety campaign, Safe as Houses, which was set up following the fire in South London Tower Block, Lacknell House, two years ago. Research we carried out as part of that campaign, and indeed research carried out by other organisations since then, um, notably the CIH, um, revealed a lot of uncertainty among social landlords about their responsibilities in this field. And no doubt we'll be picking up on some of those issues today. Um, before we get started, I just want to say a, a few quick words to the attendees um, about webinars and how you can get the most out of today. Um, I know most of you um, will have attended the webinar before, but uh, please bear with me for a minute for those who haven't. Um, basically, it works um, much like any face-to-face -face seminar you might have been to in the past. We'll hear from our panellists um, for around about seven minutes each, um, during which time you can follow their PowerPoint presentations on your screens. Um, there'll be plenty of time for debate and questions at the end. Um, to ask a question, you need to use the question, bar, uh, question box, which is on the, the right of your screens. Um, you can hear us, hopefully, um, but we can't hear you, so um, please don't try and shout out. Um, uh, just use the question box to fire questions to people. Um, your type question can only be seen by the panellists until it's answered, and then it can be seen by everybody else. You can post a question at any time during the session, um, not just at the end. So um, as the presentation is going through, um, if any questions are arising, um, uh, again, just type them into the box. Um, I'll do my best um, uh, once the presentation is over to get through all the questions during the time we have, um, but the panellists can also answer by typing responses at any time. Um, and we'll be doing that throughout the, uh, the morning. Um, you can also use the chat box, um, also on the right of your screen, just above the um, Q&A box. Um, uh, and any comments posted on, on uh, in the chat box can be seen by all the participants. All the presentations that we'll um, hear this morning will be available to download at the end, as well transcripts of the Q&A and chat boxes. Um, and also, we would encourage people to uh, take a moment to complete the feedback form right at the end of this session, um, as this will ensure we aren't out any problems for next time. Right, so without further ado, I think um, we can launch straight into um, uh, the first presentation. Um, and again, as previously mentioned, we're starting off this morning with Nick Coombe, who's the Head of Fire Safety with London Fire Brigade. Uh, and I will just transfer control to him now. Great. Morning, Nick. Good morning everyone. Okay, my name is Nick Coombe, I'm Head of Fire Safety Policy for the London Fire Brigade uh, and I'm here today to hopefully give you some advice and good practice that the enforcing authorities uh, use when assessing housing and housing providers. I can just get my slides to move. I 
engine having a bit of technical trouble here at the moment. Okay, looks like we're, we're in business. Okay, since 2006, the common areas of multi-occupied housing have come under the eyes of the Fire and Rescue Services for the first time. These areas are also covered by the Housing Act, and this overlap has been the subject of many debate, especially since the tragic events of Blackenall House in London in 2009. There are some key people I think you need to understand if you're going to if you're going to take part in any kind of fire safety issues with uh, housing, and these are the following people: um, the responsible person. Under the order, the responsible person is normally the employer or a person in control of the premises in connection with a trade or business, or it's the owner. But it can also be what we call a 5-3 person, which comes under Article 5-3, a person in control. Now, this can be anyone who has control over the premises, i.e. fire alarm engineer, any kind of construction worker who puts fire safety measures in, or it can even be a leaseholder who might be in charge of the front door of their flats or, or, or issues they put in the, the common areas. Competent person is another key area. To carry out uh, your fire safety duties correctly, you have to, you know, employ or appoint, as it says, competent persons. Okay, and these are competent with sufficient training and experience or knowledge and other qualities. The relevant person is the person we're trying to protect. That is any person who is lawfully on the premises or is in the vicinity of uh, who could be in danger from fire. Now, although the flats of a, a common park block of flats are not covered under the order, the people inside them are relevant persons, so they need to be taken into account with the risk assessment. And the risk assessment is the, is the fundamental underpinning of uh, an assessment of what the dangers from fire are. This should be carried out by a competent person. Recently, a group which I sit on, the Fire, and Risk, uh, Fire Risk Assessment Competence Council, issued a draft guidance on what are the competencies of a fire risk assessor. And I think anyone who's, who's undertaking this uh, assessment or thinking of an employing fire risk assessors need to look at this document and ask the right questions as are the people competent. And I would especially say in blocks of flats, you need someone with a real understanding of passive fire, prote fire protection. The fire risk assessment is only two things you legally have to record on it, which is that people that are especially at risk and the significant findings. And the significant findings are the measures that have been or will be taken to comply. One of the issues that's covered in the order in, in a very small way, Article 11, the fire safety arrangements, are actually one of the key bits to managing the fire safety in your premises because this talks about how you are going to manage the fire safety through maintenance, through everything else, and how you're going to keep that premises safe for the years to come. So what if you're a large housing provider, what's the best thing to do? You need to basically risk assess your portfolio of properties first. Try and grade them into high, medium and low. And there are certain things you can do to do that. Look at the vulnerability of the residents that are there. Look at the height, the size, the age, the layout of the premises, the method of construction, and even the demographics of the area, because this will have an impact on any arson risk or anything like that. Once you've done that, you can then set out a prioritise and plan how you're going to deal with the risk assessments and how you're going to deal with the um, way that you are going to introduce the action plans that will arise from your risk assessment. It's all about the money sometimes, unfortunately. In this current climate, everyone's looking how they can save money, and sometimes cutting back on safety seems a good idea, but it's not always the right idea. Where possible, you need to have a large view on how you're going to pay for everything that needs to be done and try and sometimes tie in with other risk assessors, okay, and uh, sorry, other housing providers so that they can uh, see that, uh, you know, for example, what I'm trying to say is if you need 1,500 doors, okay, uh, and someone else needs 1,500 fire doors, getting in together will get you cheaper ways of how you can procure that. But you also need to allow money, what I call for petty cash. If you have a fire or an inspection where something immediate needs to be done, you need to have that money, you know, to satisfy the requirements of the law. 
So what about the enforcement? There are two enforcers in regard of, of uh, uh, blocks of flats and housing. One is the Fire and Rescue Services and one is housing. Okay, and both enforcers need to comply with the Enforcement Concordat and take regards of the Regulators Compliance Code. Two of the main ones is, is we need to be reasonable and we need to be proportional to the risk. What we should not be doing is making you spend far too much money, to, which is in proportion to the risk of what could happen in that building. And I think this is something that you need to ask your fire and rescue services if you think they are not doing that. What I would always say, any notice, any let you get from the fire and rescue service, get into dialogue with them. Don't be afraid to question what they're saying. Don't be afraid to talk to them and say, look, I'm not sure you're being reasonable here, and see if you can come to some agreement. What you'd need to know as well is that regard, most fire and rescue services now will carry out post files on every incident where the regulatory reform order applies so they can look at how the measures worked. Okay, If there has been an injury in that fire or, you know, you know, a, a death which I hope doesn't happen, then obviously they'll be looking from a more enforcement point of view. And what if it does go wrong? I think we need, it's, it's clear to remind you that there can be some tragedy events and also what can go wrong if you're a responsible person. And I've, I've got some cases here that I think might bring it home to people that are in the housing. Douglas and Gordon were a managing agent who were fined in excess of £100,000 and costs for three breaches of the RRO. And this was just found by an inspection, not followed by a fire. John O'Rourke was a risk assessor for himself, and he was actually jailed for a poor risk assessment, and he was what we call a 5-3 person. Again, found by inspection, not following a fire. Michael Arthur Millins was a HMO owner who was jailed for 30 months following uh, some gas and fire offences, and this was following a fire, and someone was severely injured. And Mr. Parlack was a landlord, and he was the very first person to be jailed under the RO. He was a HMO owner, and this was following a fatal fire. So you can see the penalties are quite severe if you don't get it right. So what I would say to you is try and engage with your fire and rescue service. Try and get competent advice from outside to do a competent, suitable, and sufficient risk assessment, and this could alleviate you facing the penalties that are there should you fail. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, and without further ado, um, I will hand over to Nick Cross, who's the head of housing management with Southampton City Council. Um, just be, just uh, before I do so, though, um, we've got some questions coming through um, now, but obviously this is your opportunity to um, uh, address the panelists directly and um, get get them responding to your your questions as. As, as the presentations unfold, so um, yeah, just get get those questions coming in if that's okay. Um, right, Nick, it's um, over to you, and I'll just transfer control now. Yeah. alluded to in the introduction, uh, we had a significant fire in a tower block last year where sadly two firefighters uh, lost their lives and as a result of that a number of pieces of work have been done in Southampton to look at some of the issues that we've had to deal with as a, as a consequence. So just very quickly in, in context, um, we had a, a fairly severe fire, ninth floor of a tower block, um, the fire was contained within a single flat where it started, we evicted over 40 families in the middle of the night and obviously a huge practical operation in the managing the scene in the aftermath and, and as I said sadly two firefighters did lose their lives. The block as you can see in, in the picture is, uh, is a very large block, 150 flats in the total block, about 40 were evacuated, one flat was completely gutted, significant water damage to two stacks of flats the directly below uh, and the row to the side of that and significant smoke damage on three floors. Um, and lots of investigations underway um, because of sadly the deaths uh, there was a number of investigations uh, and many officers of um, police fire and the HSC were over the scene. The reality of what happened was that the uh, fire started in a single flat 
took over two hours to extinguish, but was actually contained within the flat. So the, the structure of the building did its job. It contained the fire, uh, and no other properties were, were significantly damaged. The block is a scissor block, um, which for, hopefully many of you will know what that is, but for those that don't, the, the block is essentially a, a block of maisonettes that enter on one floor and have a fire exit on another floor. So although the fire was on one flat, it actually affected three direct floors because of the fire escapes that come in and out of different floors. The block itself did have an agreed fire risk assessment that had only been carried out the month previously with the, in partnership with Hampshire Fire Brigade. None of our residents were actually injured, and indeed most occupants of the 150 flats were able to remain in their flats during the fire and uh, in the immediate aftermath and continuing. Moving on to lessons learned, um, there were some significant shared lessons that we had with the fire service, which I'll just go through very quickly. Um, as I said, they did have a risk assessment on the tower block. That had been done in the partnership with the fire service. But what we looked at in hindsight was that although that had been done with the local station commander and the local operatives, actually headquarters at the Hampshire Fire Service um, had a slight difference of opinion in relation to some of the issues that the, the risk assessment picked up. So the risk assessments done post the fire were, were now done in a much, uh, much more rigorous way with um, the headquarters at Hampshire Fire and Rescue with a new process. So we're absolutely clear that, uh, that we are meeting all our statutory responsibilities. We regularly use our blocks for fire training exercises with the, with, the, with the fire brigade, and that's excellent for local fire crews about orientation, particularly with scissor blocks that are quite complex to understand. But of course, in a major fire like this, we had outside crews from all over Hampshire, many of whom had never been in a tower block of this nature. And so the information about what the block looked like and how it worked and the structure was very, very important. So what we've now got is we've got information readily accessible for fire crews, uh, which includes things like asbestos um, a database, information about um, residents, vulnerabilities, structure, layout plans of the map, and all sorts of things. And that's contained within a lockable box held within the warden's uh, office within each, uh, each block. That is accessible by the fire service through a master key system. And the other thing we identified is that the, uh, while we do regular fire safety campaigns, we need to ensure that on a regular basis we keep reiterating simple messages, for example, about the stay put policy rather than mass evacuation. Because people do forget, people do uh, aren't sure, and people need regular reminders. As far as us being a landlord is concerned, a number of things that we've looked at are now considered as a result of this. So regular program inspection and certification. We, we do a whole load of uh, issues in our block, from checking fire doors to dry riser testing and, and electrical, uh, electrical checks. Some of the work is subcontracted but that doesn't remove our responsibility for ensuring it is completed. So you know, make sure you're subcontractors and you know exactly what they're expected to do and what the reporting mechanisms are back to you as a landlord. We also um, have found out that um, a number of the pieces of work that have been done in blocks, so for example, when BT or the utilities come in and do wiring or cabling, pipe work changes, some of the fire stopping haven't been properly reinstated. So we pick that up and you need to make sure that in your details of your contractors, their specification of work, ensures making good the fire stopping to an agreed standard. Is your signage clear and up to date? Our blocks were built in the 1960s and some of the signage was a little out of date. So we've now updated all our signage and made sure it's clear on every floor that what people are expected to do. Um, what do residents do in the case of a fire? When did you last remind them? We have a stay put policy. Most residents understand that, but when there's a major incident, people worry, people panic, people think they should be, moved, be coming out of the property. So remind them what to do in case of a fire. Um, and vulnerabilities was a particular issue for us. What do you know about your residents' vulnerabilities? Do they have any specific needs? Do they have things that you need to take into account in case of a fire? So access, uh, cultural issues, language issues, um, oxygen cylinders for people with medical circumstances. Pets was an interesting one. We had a number of people with interesting pets, such as snakes and iguanas, that require very specific requir um, uh, requirements to look after, uh, and you can't just take them out like a cat. Some specific things we've done, we now uh, check our emergency lighting every month and not every quarter. Um, uh, windows in the communal corridors are now open by a master key system. What that means is if you have a smoke filled corridor, the fire brigade can open the window um, and can allow some ventilation in. Um, we've reapplied all our fire retardant paint in uh, corridors on ceilings, um, which is particularly important because we have a number of wooden surfaces in some of our tower blocks. 
Um, we've checked all front doors on flats to make sure they're all fire rated. And the particular challenge there is leaseholders who uh, regularly change their front doors. How can you confirm that they are still fire rated doors? What's your landlord responsibility? As I said, we've updated the, sign, the signage. Um, and we, we, we check all the communal fire doors daily. And that's checking the door closes, make sure they close properly, and make sure all the glass is intact and the strips, fire strips around them are, are, are still intact and not been painted over. One of the other things we've specifically done is we've introduced a program of tenancy visits in our tower blocks. And as I said earlier, some of the vulnerabilities were a key issue that we identified. Now, whilst we can't, as a landlord tenor, tell them how to live, there are some lifestyle issues that might impact on others. We found a number of properties where they'd done internal alterations, they'd taken out internal fire doors, knocked down walls, and some of these can breach existing fire precautions. You need to be aware and, and need to be able to rectify those. We had a number of issues with hoarding and cluttered properties, which might present a fire risk or an escape risk in, in, in if there was a major incident. Because of the nature of the block and it has its own individual um, um, fire exits, some people had installed padlocks on those to prevent their children from just escaping. And whilst that was understandable, we need to make sure that they're not compromising their own means of escape. We picked up a number of safeguardings and other social concerns, which we've shared with our colleagues in children's and adult services to make sure that everybody knows some of the particular issues. Obviously, the occupants of a flat who's living there, are they the people that we think they are? What are they doing in the flat? We found one property where they'd bypassed the electricity, and clearly that's a, a risk to the block. Um, and language and cultural issues. Like many large cities, Southampton has a diverse population. We have language issues in a number of our blocks and cultural issues. And some cultural issues are that some, some uh, Muslim um, races will, will use um, gas or, or, or other means of cooking. And if you don't have that in a tower block, they might be using propane cylinders or gas cylinders. And you need to understand the implication and the risk for, for that. So in summary, um, what I would say is make sure you're working in partnership with your local fire service. Make sure you have an up-to-date program of inspections and assessment and know who does what and when. Most fire precautions that you can take are simple and not expensive. It's not massive amounts of money and work you need to put into the block to make sure it complies. Know who your vulnerable tenants are. Share any issues or concerns with others, including your colleagues in, uh, in, in social services. And regularly remind tenants of what they need to do in the case of a fire. Great, thanks very much, Nick. Um, and uh, without further ado, we will move on to Michael Vickers, who's a Senior Investment Manager with Liverpool Mutual Homes. Um, and I will just transfer control now. Um, morning, everybody. Thank you. Um for listening. I'm um, stepping in this morning for Dave Woods, who's been um, unfortunately unable to attend the session. Um, so I'm going to go through his presentation as, um, and, and, and hopefully I'll be able to answer some queries on that following the presentation as well. The, the first aspect for, for the presentation is a shift from fire for a minute and moving on to gas safety, which is in an, an equally important area for all landlords to consider and a, a key performance uh, uh, in this area is, is required by all for the safety of our residents. Just let me see if I can move on. Oh, there we go. Um, and ensuring the landlord's gas safety records is, is absolutely key to this. The, the area I want to really focus on through the presentation is around landlords and what, what they can do and how they can go about improving performance in this area. And one of the key areas for this is around the first time access. And I don't, don't intend to, to read the, script, the slides verbatim. Um, but one of the key things here is, is really about um, a couple of key things, which is publicity, which is about the education to our customers about the importance of carrying a fire um, safety checks out. Or 
and that goes along with awareness as well. And you'll see on that first slide there a large hoarding that was used in, in an area that was predominantly our properties to draw customers' attention to the fact that they, the issues with gas and, and the safety issues and the potential harm that that could cause. Um, the, so, so the key, key area there is about the publicity about getting that information to customers. The next part really is then about the incentive, about what we can do to incentivize people to, to actually come in and, and get that first access. And one area which we use and a, and a number of other landlords use is actually to put people who allow us the first time access into a draw. And, and obviously that incentivizes a number of people. And the other area which then we're, we're kind of getting into the away from the carrot and a bit into the stick is to start using programmers for our heating systems which have the service interval records on and will actually inform the resident that their service is due prior to that happening. Now a number of the different landlords that are dealing with this in, in different ways and the route we've taken here is that the the system will actually produce an audible alarm 14 days prior to the anniversary and it will remind them on the screen to contact us and give give the resident our number to ring up and make the appointment for the service. And following that, if that's not happened and we don't get into the service, we can actually program the system to actually intervene or interrupt the gas supply to the boiler um, and inter interrupt the service, uh, the heating to the property. Obviously very limited to reduce any risk in terms of people not having the appropriate heat in the properties. But again, it's, it's, a, it's a bit more a stick than a carrot. Um, and then it comes into to actually ensure and we enforce. And, and the record we have on this is for the last two years we've actually achieved 100% on our access for gas safety inspections and we're on plan to do so this year. Um, some of the simple things we do is when we try to get access and we're knocking on doors is we'll actually put um, a, a poster or sticker across the door and across specifically where they need to put the, lock, the key in the lock which will then make sure people are aware of that we've been trying to get access and, and if needs be then we will then proceed on to injunctions and pass the details through to our solicitors. The, the figure on that is that this year, for example, we've had 78% on first time access um, with the remaining then either on second or on solicitor's letters, but no deliver actually had to go to action on. Um, and, and the key to, to delivering all this is around ensuring that the process is followed robustly, that you have the right reporting in, in place in the organization and you're reducing the risk within the organization. Now moving on to fire safety which is another area we've developed we feel uh, quite well within the organization is, um, is, is how our approach to fire safety. And I think I'll probably go back to what Meg said in the first presentation that, that really the key to getting this right is about having a very good relationship and very good dialogue to with the fire service and understanding exactly what our requirements are and what the expectations of the fire service are and, and really that links down to understanding what the risk is, uh, working with partners, the fire service and any other partners in ways of reducing that risk 
Um, and, and again, a similar comment really from the gas is about publicity, is about making our customers understand the risks of fires. And this is particularly pertinent to, um, for example, shelter schemes and communal areas, but making them aware. Uh, and one of the things we've done through our programs here is to is to run um, a very extensive renovation of all our communal areas. And we're still in the process of doing that, but that is about ensuring we've got that compartmentalization of fire areas, that we are replacing doors, we're upgrading lighting, um, and we're removing as much as possible any flammable products from the communal areas. And you'll see from the, the next couple of slides, in terms of where we've come from, uh, we've got 630 upgraded. 80% um, of these since then, and the last 20% will be done in the next 12 months. And we moved from the, the traditional line of vinyl flooring, so we've moved on to ceramic flooring, to um, non-flammable wall coverings, and to clear signage, to LED lighting and emergency lighting, which has given us the, um, to improve that, that in there, we've gone to loft cover, covers to make sure everything's in the lofts are compartmentalized, that the loft covers are also um, fire retardant. So, so a lot, a lot of things we've done there, and then moving on to the sheltered. Obviously, we've we've put the girder boxes in with the agreement of the fire service, and uh, we've developed the personal emergency egress plans again, which are then accessible by the fire service. And this is all backed up then by a regular inspection process by our staff who are trained and we're continuing to train, and also in terms of employing third-party professionals to come in and do the, the more formal risk assessments. And that's me done, thank you very much. Great, thanks very much, Michael. Um, uh, an interesting session on, on both um, gas and fire safety, and I think we've got a couple of direct questions um, for, for you that have been posted while you've been speaking, so um, if you take, take a quick look through that, that would be great. Um, right. And our final final speaker today um, is Graham Fieldhouse. He's a consultant who specialises in fire safety and social housing. Um, and Graham, it's over to you. Uh, spread of fire. That's somebody having left a, a buggy in the escape route, and that's the confirmation is the complementation has been breached simply by that as you can see in uh, the protecting means of escape under article 14 uh, fire doors are a key part of that and this was a picture from the evening standard of the block sister block to lacano house after the fire and clearly you can see that from the picture themselves not only is the door being chopped open but also the uh, door closers are not working properly these are the things that are going to kill people. These are the things we need to get right. Uh, the survey of Kick the Wedge Bioco did a survey in 2007. Fire escapes obstructed 80%, doors wedged open 65%, door closers removed or disengaged 80%. And my experience over the last few years is that this is still happening. This is still a problem we need to, we need to address. So when is the fire door no protection? Well, doors and frames, do they meet the British standards? Intermittent seals, they've been painted over. Is that a problem? Well, actually, the British standard says that the seal themselves, that are painted over, isn't in itself, as long as it's not too much, a over problem. But if they're smoke seals, then that would protect, would not protect, and therefore that becomes a problem. Ironmongery, is it correct? Is it properly tested? Uh, glazing, can we see? Can we see what the glazing rate is? if it's properly rated glazing. Fire end rated air transfer grills, British uh, standards uh, for those, and also the um, Part B, well, they really oughtn't be in the escape route unless they're linked into the fire alarm. 
do the gaps meet the correct British standards of fire doors required for smoke? Three mil around the entirety of the door. Those are things that we need to be sure about. We should be okay with a new build then, shouldn't we? Well, we might assume that everything's okay with the new built properties, but is it? My experience has been having looked at over 100 new built properties. Every one of them that I looked at really had some issues that needed to be addressed. Quite often, uh, putting fire doors in by somebody who's not uh, certified to put in that fire door, and they've ended up uh, breaching the certification of that fire door by cutting the top of the door, uh, which they shouldn't do And on most of the certifications that you see, unless it's a solid wood door. So if the fire door's not installed properly, then it's not going to do its job and it's not going to be a properly certified door. What about fire stopping? Fire stopping is a real issue, even in new built properties. As you can see, some, some of the photographs that I got from uh, Niall Rowan at the ASFP, and these are things that I've, I've also given photographs to Niall about. These things that we're seeing, in the four pictures at the bottom, it's only one, two, the third picture along, which is correct. The other three pictures in there are failings. So this is not a one-off. This is happening quite regularly. This is new built. This is properties that are being handed over today that are being given to us like this. Now, I saw some comments earlier on about certification of fire doors. So what's compliant over certified? Um, we can look at a fire door and we can say, well, that's a notional fire door. That door looks like it's going to do a job of sorts. But if we say that, the responsibility then sits with the organization, with the person. Uh, whereas a certified door, if it's a certified door and it's been installed correctly and that door is there to do its job and that door fails, then the brigade are going to be asking questions of the person who certified that door as being the proper fire door. But if it's only a compliant door, therefore the gaps around it, but we've got no certification on it, or it's an old door and we're not sure, we can never really be 100% sure about whether that door is going to do its job in a fire. So, what do we look for? The ASFP sign there for, for properly uh, carpomentalized, properly fire stopped, that's what we're looking for. On a fire door, what are we looking for? Has it got the BWF stick or, or some other indication that it's a properly certified door? Working with the brigade and the enforcement team to get it right. Don't be frightened of working with the brigade. In East London, we've just been working with Guy Foster from the London Fire Brigade. We, we did this thing where we did a priority rating of all our properties. So we, we did the priority rating of the property type, the people in there, and their ability to evacuate. And I've got this information. If anybody wants it, ask me, and I'll quite happily send it to you free. But on that, we then be, were able to set out what exactly, which property come into which priority, and which ones we were going to deal with first. Because as uh, Nick uh, Coombs said initially, you know, we can't, we haven't got a, a, an endless pot of money. And so what we've done is set that pot of money aside in different ways, and we're going to address the smoke control within the property. Why? Because it's that that's going to kill people. Uh, smoke, uh, as far as a room, six foot meters by six meters by three meters, a pencil hole, something as small as that, will fill that room with smoke in under four minutes. And levels as low as 1% can be considered lethal. D disorientation will take place in 20 seconds. Unconsciousness and death will follow soon after. So we need to set the priorities. We need to agree a time frame to protect life and property and the organization's reputation. And that's really zip through my, uh, my thing. And any questions, please ask. Fantastic. Cheers, cheers, Graham. Thanks, thanks very much for that. And we've got um, um, plenty of questions um, which uh, um, have, have been um, fired at various members of the panel and, and um, uh, the, the panel collectively as, as you've been speaking. So um, I think without further ado, we'll, we'll start to um, uh, address some of those, um, those questions. I guess maybe the first one I'll, I'll kick off with. And I know some, some of the panelists touch on this. Um, there's a question from Dan Thomas who, who asks, is there a gap in the law and subsequent guidance on fire safety in relation to what goes on in residents' homes? So not just the landlord's responsibilities, but residents themselves. Um, and, I, and I guess the, 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 the obvious question is, you know, what, what, what can landlords um, or indeed the, the fire service do about that if there is a gap? Um, and I 
don't know that we can perhaps start with um, uh, Nick Coombe, um, just, just, just very quickly on this, and then um, I'll, I'll go around the panel. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. <laughs> it's, it's basically, is, is there a gap um, in the law um, uh, when it comes to um, residents protecting their own um, uh, property, um, uh, making their own property safe? Um, and I, I guess um, uh, you know, you know, if if if, if, there are, if there's gaps in you know one property or two properties, um, th does that then um, put, put other residents in uh, at risk? Can landlords do anything about it? Uh, does the fire fire service um, have much of a role to play um, when it when it comes to to um, individual tenants and residents? Okay. Firstly, obviously, I'd have to say that the uh, domestic parts of blocks of flats and that are not covered by fire for the fire brigades legislation. The Housing Act, I believe, does cover it, so there might be some points there. I think, though, we've probably got a, a very custom and tradition that we'd have to go against where a, a person's home is their castle and they feel they have the right to alter things and change things to see how they fit. I do think that is where landlords need to maybe have tighter tenancy agreements or tighter contracts to make sure that no changes, more regular inspection of internal uh, flats to make sure that the changes have not affected the other people and I think that's a, that's a good point to raise. Unfortunately though these inspections are difficult to carry out, getting access and also difficult to enforce so I'm not sure there's a gap in the legislation. I think it's a case of more uh, working together with people for them to understand these changes could not only affect their own safety but other people's. Great, thanks. And um, uh, Nick Cross now. Um, um, I mean, we we heard obviously you and and Michael both talking about working with residents, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't know whether you can just in, in, enlarge on that when it comes to um, them protecting their own properties. Yeah, certainly not. And I mean, I think I think this Nick raises a really interesting point. I mean, there are two things really in our experience. One is obviously as a landlord and as the building owner and responsible person, you have responsibility for the structural integrity of that building. So as a landlord, we have a responsibility to ensure that the tenants have not done anything that might compromise that structural integrity. Yep. Certainly we found on a scissor block uh, where there's an integral, there's an internal fire door, some people had removed that fire door um, and that had damaged the, the, the structural integrity. So as a landlord, we have a responsibility to address that. Granted, it doesn't come up under the fire risk assessment, which is why we've introduced a number of uh, a practice of tenancy visits afterwards because we wanted to, sh to check that the overall block was not affected by people's individual actions. Yep. The harder area is where you've got people who might live in certain circumstances or might have certain situations that might otherwise cause some damage uh, to the block or might put, be putting other people at risk. And I mentioned in my presentation about hoarding, um, yep. you know, they're generally unkempt properties. Um, use of you know portable gas appliances, which are obviously very very dangerous. Now clearly there isn't. It's very difficult, and I think the tenancy agreement there does come into into play. It's what your tenancy agreement says, and what you say is is reasonable in the end. Uh, and it's a very difficult balance between all of that. In our tenancy visit program, what we've actually done um, is we recognise that people need to get something for something out of a visit. We don't want. We haven't called it an inspection. We don't want it just to be seen as we're coming in to check up on you. So actually, it's a two-way process about support and sharing. So it's not only about us checking some things, but it's also seeing if the people need any support, do they need, have they got any other issues, what about their benefits, what about welfare, uh, employment opportunities, training, a number of other bits. And in our pilot scheme that we ran, it actually an identical sister block to where we had the fire. Uh, we got 100% take up, even from uh, even from the leaseholders. So that was very, very encouraging, and people are not seeing it as a as a negative; they're seeing it as a positive. Great, thanks, thanks very much. And I, I noticed from some of the comments, um, you, you, you've got a bit of a fan club building up. So, um, yeah, no, cheers, cheers Nick, um, and um, Michael. I, I, I don't know, same question to you, really, about um, what you've been doing with with residents um, in in their own homes, really. Um. Yeah, I, th I think. Um in terms of that, some very good comments being made. I think the, in, in terms of the customers' own homes, it's very much about the, the comment is their castle, and it's very difficult for us to go in there. But one thing that's um, a very good example is probably um, around safeguarding and customer safeguarding, and that's around training staff, contractors, and any other partners going into these properties to to identify vulnerable customers 
and as vulnerable in, in many ways as um, Nick was just saying, not just about the um, fire risks, but for example, if they go in and you've got someone who's living in one room of the property and has dozens and dozens of candles around, and, and there's you know, it's, it's a risk of causing a fire. Yeah. Now, some good practice probably on that was in, in Leeds, uh, not actually in Liverpool, in, in my previous role, where there was an agreement with the local, again, with the local fire service, that we could refer these cases through to them where we thought somebody was living in an atmosphere, in, in an area where they were at risk of causing a fire and causing harm to themselves. And the fire brigade would then actually go out and do a visit in terms of their preven prevention work. And, and I think it comes back to, to, you know, it comes back to, it's not just a housing maintenance issue or a housing management issue, it comes to that safeguarding our customers and safeguarding our properties and, and how we do that. But it's through all staff and all contact that we have with customers to identify these issues and identify that all those staff and, and operatives have the right training to understand what they should be looking for and, and ensuring that fire safety is part of them. Great, and, and Gra Graham, same, same issue, but I, I just wondered as well, because I mean, obviously we talk, we've heard people talking about the relationships um, um, with, with the fire service as well, so I mean, um, obviously um, but both of a role in terms of education of, of tenants, but I, I just wonder whether you can also enlarge on um, how important the relationship is between the fire service and uh, the landlord, um, um, and, and obviously having worked in a, for, for a, you know, a number of landlords, whether, the, whether that's been different in, depending on different areas you, you, you've been in and um, uh, what, what, you know, effectively, what, what's the most effective working relationship in terms of um, ensuring properties are safe and everybody knows their responsibilities? Yeah, I think that one of the things that we have to recognise is that Fire Brigade are not interested in going out and, uh, and issuing fines and sending people to prison for breaching fire safety. Their interest is making sure that uh, people are safe, properties are, are safe, and their people are safe when they go in to fight a fire and that everything that reasonably can be done is being done. Um, I, I've got a great guy that I'm working with, Guy Foster at the London Fire Brigade, Andy Jack, who, who uh, I know quite well, uh, put uh, Guy, Guy's team leader for, for East London area, and we sat down and we've worked things through, and he's been very proactive in, in assisting and helping, uh, and we've helped and worked with him. Uh, we put together the uh, priority ratings of the property. So we looked at, I mean, through my presentation, I was trying to zip through it as, as was requested. <laughs> but I'll give it a <laughs> bit more detail <laughs> now. Um, but, uh, you know, the priority ratings, we looked at the property types, we looked at the properties that were most at risk. The, you know, uh, we then looked at the people that were, were, were most at risk and rated them. And we looked at the ability to evacuate. So if you couldn't evacuate day or night, then, then you were highest priority, evacuate during the, the day, but couldn't do it at night. And we went down those, that sort of listing, and we, we sat down with them, and we worked out. And, and all, after that, we then got priority base for the properties. And then we looked at what was the key thing that was going to, to kill people. And obviously, carpet mentalization, your fire doors, your smoke yeah. control was the start point. There were other issues. We did have some issues in regard to potential risk of arson. And we looked at that. But the, the fact is that it was a fluid document. And, you know, working with Guy, working with some of the other guys who were who on the enforcement team, that means that they contact me now. As soon as they've got something that they need to go in and sort out, they contact me. I've got a great working relationship with them. We can talk to them. I mean, I know a lot of people, there was some stuff going on about fire doors. I saw a, a minute ago that was flying around yeah. uh, and the question that we had before about fire doors. We also need to think about carbon ventilation. In, within properties, purpose-built blocks of flats, I know Colin's on, uh, online and making some comments, purpose-built blocks of flats are there, that's great. What about the ones where we've converted um, properties into two or three flats from a house? The uh, ceiling and the floor above, that is uh, shared, that's carpet that area needs to be properly carpet-mented. That is a shared space, that is covered by the RRO. We, how the fire spreads through that building. I know there was questions as well. When Do you we think spoke. there's a lot of confusion about that as well? I mean, when you're, when you're talking about that being shared space, I mean, is, are people confused about what counts as shared space, what the responsibilities are? How, I mean, how on the ball are, are, are people generally in terms of um, um, knowing exactly what they should be doing? And um... 
I, I, I've, my personal uh, experience has been that uh, you know you've got the RRO, which is for fire safety. Uh, I think there's almost a, a second tier that deals with um, the social housing aspect of that because there's a complete difference between somebody who'll go out and uh, uh, look at uh, uh, big office blocks and everybody everybody can be trained and there's extinguishers everywhere and um, you know e everything's covered like that and then you come to a, a residential housing. I I'm on a, a link in with a number of uh, health and safety professionals across the country in social housing and I know at the moment there's a thing running through there about this question of uh, should we have fire extinguishers? Mm. Now I know that under the purpose built blocks, in fact I had the, the conversation actually with Colin and Colin's online and maybe you can comment on that, but the removal of fire extinguishers is a sensible thing to do because otherwise you're actually getting people to go back into their flat after they've shut the door, which goes against any advice that is given. It's it's completely different kettle of fish to somebody who's doing risk assessments on, on uh, you know, normal businesses. On, on that note, perhaps, um, if we could maybe just jump back um, quickly to, to, to Nick Coombe, um, um, just, just in terms of um, uh, things like fire extinguishers, um, the, the types of action people should be taking in, in blocks. Um, I mean, I know, I, as far as I'm aware, the, the guidance, I think, is, is, is generally speaking to, to, to remove that, that type of thing to, again, as, as Graham was saying, to prevent people going back in. Um, but I, I'm certainly aware from previous conversations I've had, and I think some of the, conversa uh, some of the questions on here today, that, that that's a real area of confusion um, for, for landlords and residents, I think. I, I think residents are often quite unhappy if they see these things disappearing. Um, um, so I, I just wonder you know, what, what the official line is and, and perhaps how you go about engaging um, with, with tenants and residents if, if you're taking them out. Yeah, I think you're right that it's quite a grey area and, and, and it'd be very difficult for me to give you a definitive because of the, the different types of blocks, the different types of areas that they're in. For example, you know, in certain areas of London, they'd make great missiles chucked out of windows of the, <laughs> the 17th and 18th floors of tower blocks and wouldn't last five minutes, plus they'd be uh, discharged and there'd be a constant maintenance and charging and costing for the, for the land Lords, which is obviously not reasonable. However, if you add a, a, a really nice um, uh, purpose-built box of flats not too far from where I'm sitting now, where they've got concierge and things like that, people there who might be able to deal with the fire, then I believe that the extinguishers are a good way to stop in small fires if, if they're properly trained from, from, uh, from growing. But in, in your normal run-of-the-mill social landlord blocks of flats, I, you know, I agree with the, the guidance that was issued um, recently in the purpose of the that actually fire extinguishers are not required. You know, it, it, our message is about getting people out of their homes making sure they're safe, promoting, you know, smoke detection in all in all residential properties and ensuring that people get out alive rather than having to take a risk to fight in a fire. It, this is slightly different again in sheltered housing where there might be wardens, where there are people trained, again, different different circumstances. Mm. You know, I, I think though that, you know, the risk assessment can very easily determine whether they are required or not, you know, and that's the, as I say all the time, that is the base point for most things. And, and I thought we'll, we'll come back to sheltered housing in a minute actually because there have been a good few questions about, about that this morning, but just very quickly on, on, on that issue of um, um, uh, fire extinguishers and the like. Um, um, uh, Michael, I don't know whether you want to go, go next on that, um, just in terms of the approach that um, Liverpool's taken and also how it's engaged with residents on that, that issue. Yeah, I think it's really the back end of the points that were just made, really, which is that, you know, they're not required um, through the legislation or through the, the, unless they're identified through the risk assessment. And really the, the problems that they can cause are probably greater than some of the solutions that they can provide. So uh, in terms of that, I think you know, it's, it's a difficult situation for probably not having the best. Right. Okay. And, um, and, and uh, just on just on that issue to round it off, um, uh, uh, Nick. So it's uh, Nick Cross. Sorry. Um, if, if you can just talk us through the, the approach that Southampton's taken in terms of. Um, um, I mean, I know you mentioned it earlier, but um, uh, how you've done that and um, how you've engaged with residents in terms of um, uh, fire extinguishers and the like. Yeah. I mean, again, the same same comments as the other speakers. Really, yeah. we you know we we see them as more of a risk than a than a prevention. So actually, we don't have them. We've re we've removed them some time ago from 
from all of our blocks and our sheltered schemes. Um, how how did residents react to that when you did that? I mean, was were, were they concerned when you when you no, sent them out? I don't think they really the were. No, I mean, it, we didn't. It was ma- not a massive issue. It seems to have, it, it, it went relatively straightforwardly. I mean, it was some time ago that we that we did it and we we, we mitigated it by, you know, obviously the risk assessments and what have you. But no, I mean we. We want residents, we have a very clear policy in the tower blocks, we want residents to stay put until advised otherwise. We don't want people going back into a block to try and become amateur firefighters because that's putting them and the services at more risk. So, no, I mean, we've, never, we've not had any issues with, with removal of those over, over the last few years. Great. Right. Well, we'll move on to a, um, uh, a very direct and um, uh, uh, practical question, I think, is from uh, Joyce Orr um, uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, and she, she was asking, do you, have, uh, do you have to have special certification as a tradesman to install a fire door? Um, we have them installed by um, a joiner. Um, so, Graham, I don't know whether you want to, to um, uh, kick off with, with that. I mean, again, fire doors, I mean, I think from your presentation, um, big, 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 uh, big issue. Um, um, so. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, there isn't a legal requirement to have them installed by a certified installer, but if they're not, if they haven't been installed by a certified installer, then how do you evidence that they've installed them correctly? Um, there is a requirement to be installed. Uh, you only have to get any of the uh, assessment setups that, 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 uh, for the fire doors, and they will actually set out exactly how they are installed. But my experience has been that uh, people go around and they install doors and haven't installed them correctly, and it's always how I've always done it. Um, quite often, the time the, the thing that they do is they'll cut the top of the door. To, to leave the door in and oftentimes even cut off the BWS sign that's on the top of the door and, and that sign if you read it actually says if you remove this sign or you, you cut the top of the door you, you invalidate the certification for the door so I would always recommend that somebody has been trained properly either by the, the, the company that they're installing the doors for or a third party installer to install fire doors and I certainly wouldn't uh, send somebody out to go and repair or, or to look at fire doors when there's been a problem with the door unless they have been competently trained in some way to fix and repair fire doors. I know that BWF are doing something in, in the near future, it may be something you want to have a look at, the Bishop Woodwork Federation are doing something for competency of installation, auditing and checking a fire door, so certainly some, something worth looking at. Great, uh, appreciate that. And um, I will just just move on uh, quickly to um, um, the, the, some some of the questions we've been getting on, on gas safety. Um, one from Louise uh, uh, Hughes, I think, um, uh, who's asking, do LMH uh, run an appointments program for gas checks, or is it cold calling? Um, and then Jill Stokes, who who I, I think has been um, uh, in dialogue with Nick um, about this, but um, are there any participants who achieve 100% gas safety compliance consistently? rather than a point in time, and if so, how are you doing it? And I guess as a, as a, a throwing question as well, I mean, what, what does 100% compliance mean? Does that actually mean um, um, that all of those, those boilers have actually been inspected? Um, um, because I've certainly had questions in the past about, um, you know, what, what, what exactly 100% is. Um, so, Michael, I don't know whether you want to take the floor on that. Yeah, the, uh, the 100% is 100% inspected. Um, I know in other areas some people are classed they're in the um, legal framework for enforcement, they're classed as uh, within the percentage, but, but here it means we've, we've done everything. Um, now, in terms of running 100% constantly, I don't think you, it's very difficult to do that um, throughout the year because obviously there are cases where we take enforcement action, so, so there's always going to be a number of cases where actions are going, but during the program we we try to to minimise them. In terms of the the first question, which was from Louise regarding the appointments, yes, there is an appointment system in in place, in place um, but obviously once if we can't get an appointment or we can't get access, then cold calling will be used to uh, as another tool to try and gain access to the properties. Right, and um, no, th- th- thanks for that. And um, I appreciate we've reached twelve thirty, but I, I think um, um, from conversations with the, s- the speakers yesterday, we're, we're going to 
uh, run over because we've had um, lots lots of questions through that we're going to going to try and um, uh, get through um, um, before lunchtime. So um, perhaps if we move on to um, uh, the issue about leaseholders that, that um, we'd, we've been talking about uh, briefly earlier, um, and, and again has come up a few times in, in questions, so I, th I think it's worth. Um, us running through. Um, uh, Samantha Hill um, asked, asked uh, earlier on. Um, uh, uh, I, I think it sounded almost. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure who'd mentioned it to her, but she, she said it's been mentioned that leaseholders are considered the person in control. Um, what happens if um, we um, uh, have upgraded fire safety? How have they refused to upgrade their front doors? Who has overall responsibility for the fire safety in the block? Um, again, um, a, a good number of questions about leaseholders um, um, uh, today, and uh, certainly from my experience, going back over the last um, year, or, year or two, that that's, that that really has been a uh, an area of confusion. So, um, Nick Coombe, if, if you don't mind, um, would you mind uh, kicking off with that? Yeah, uh, thanks for the difficult one. Um, yeah, leaseholders <laughs> and, and blocks of flats. I think we need to be, you know, uh, a, again, this is one of the most grayest areas that I deal with probably on a fairly daily basis in in my line of work. Um, the, we, we believe that where the leaseholder has control over that front door, oh, it's in their lease that they can change it, they can do what they want to that door, then they would be the 5-3 person uh, under the order about changing that um, that front door if it wasn't a fire door. However, in practice it becomes quite difficult to enforce because of the fact that in some leaseholder flats they have tenants and sub-tenants who are no longer, so they are not the responsible person or the person in control and there is no way of us getting hold of the person in control to get them to do it. However, so how, how, how do you go about um, um, uh, dealing with that uh, right. as an well, issue? As I said in my slide, there is another yeah. piece of legislation that a lot of people seem to forget that has fire safety in it, which is the Housing Act. And the Housing Act has some really uh, strict powers. They, in, in the long term, the Housing Act has the power to physically go and change that door. And I mean that by actually forcibly taking it off and changing it and billing the leaseholder. Obviously, uh, local authorities are reluctant to do this because they've got to get the money back. The co they have to do the cost mm -hmm. first and then get it back. And obviously, if the leaseholder is offshore, the chances of that happening are slim. But in some cases, we could serve a notice if the leaseholder's not in this country, he's not going to reply. And then even if we, we'd serve the summons, he's not going to come to court. And the chances are that door will still remain a non-fire door. So we have successfully worked with uh, a, a, a local authority who have gone down this route with us, working in partnership all the way. And that's what I would say to any local authority people listening, that that's what we want to do, and come up with the best solution for both enforcing authorities that will make the premises safe because ultimately that's what we both want. So, so, so in, uh, I mean, obviously the, the implication of that is in practice that some authorities have been taking a lead on it, but but presumably you haven't had contact with all all authorities as uh, as proactively as that anyway. Um, no, well, what, 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 how, uh, in which case, how do you, how do you have those conversations? And also, how if you're not confident that um, uh, uh, action has been taken with leaseholders, how does that affect your advice when you're going into a, a block. I think as well, what we have to work at is land landlords and managing agents are working really hard to comply with the law in most cases. Uh, they yeah. also then will, will give enough information to their leaseholders and, and that. And, and in most cases, a sensible leaseholder will put his fire door back because he understands the implications of that fire door could have an impact on other people in that building. So I would say most of the time we, we have a working arrangement that works where we don't have to serve notices, nor do the Housing Act, and people will uh, comply, you know, through you know through understanding. However, there will always be the cases where that doesn't happen, and as I said before, where that happens in certain areas, we will work with that local authority to try and, you know, to come up with a solution. We are actively trying to get all local authorities to sign up to the housing protocol. We've got a number of boroughs that have signed up to it already, and uh, with that we will work together with them to, to make the premises safe. Fantastic, and that, that seems like an appropriate point to, to, to bring Nick Cross in, in terms of leaseholders. Nick, how, how have you been working with 
um, your leaseholders and um, um, has, has that been a problem area? Um, well, I mean, I think I'd echo again, yep. you know, the comments are just made by Nick. I mean, I think the, you know, the, the overall building responsibility is with the landlord of that building. Um, and the individual leases, uh, I mean, certainly in Southampton, we have a number of our standard leases, which mean that the front door is still the responsibility of us as the landlord. Now, that doesn't stop the leaseholders changing them, but it does give us an extra tool to be able to, to, to make sure it's properly uh, meets the requirements of the building regulations. Um, the Housing Act is key. We can force entry and, and, and take action, and we have in a, a small number of cases. It's not easy, and in some instances, we have had to swallow the cost of that. The reality of it is, though, is one door that's not, um, that doesn't meet the fire regulations, if a fire happened behind that door, uh, all of a sudden the rest of the block is in jeopardy. You know? So to take you back to the case that, that I highlighted in my presentation, you know, it was a tenanted block. The fire door was in place. The fire was uh, ongoing within that property for over two hours, and the fire door remained intact, even though it's only a 30-minute rated door. So actually, the property itself, you know, containing the fire within the property is the most important thing, and that has to be the concern of, of, of a landlord of a building. And if the leaseholder is not playing ball, then you have to use all your powers uh, as necessary to make sure that they do. And if that means swallowing the cost, trust me, it's easier to swallow a few hundred pounds of dealing with the front door than it is the significant amount of money you spend in if you then got an investigation of a major incident that's occurred. Uh, yes, I, I think an important uh, important point to make. And, and Graham, I, I don't know whether you, you can come in at, at this stage. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, a, a just in terms of adding anything to that debate, and and B, I mean, I, I think as a general point, you also um, mentioned uh, 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 the importance of not burying your head in the sand. Um, I mean, when it when it comes to this issue, are are, are people um, um, are that landlords being very proactive, or, or are there some that are uh, uh, burying their heads heads in the sand? Yeah, uh, well, first on the um, the 5.3 um, that uh, was, was spoken about, it's every imposed on every person who has to extend control over the premises. So you can you can use that. The brigade are, are a little reluctant about pursuing that and tend to go under Article 32.10 that uh, they can actually go against uh, any, anybody in, in the list. They don't have to actually do the landlord, the, uh, the person who owns the flat to do the landlord. So the landlord, it sits with the risk. And so one of the, the proactive things you can do to that is actually make sure that your leases reflect that they can't change anything that has any impact on fire safety and quite something quite strong in the lease about that for future leases going forward. Um, in relation to burying heads in the sand, I think one of the problems is that in the economic times that we live in, people are looking at, or oh, we've got to change all our, all our doors in the, all the escape routes and we've got to change all our front doors and... Well, it may be, but doors need to be changed anyway. So you can put them into a program of works. And this is where don't bury your head in the sand. Go and talk to your local brigade. Work with them about putting a plan of works together. They can see what you're doing. They can see where you're, you've got some rationale to your prioritizing of the works. They can see how you're going about it. Your fire risk assessment. I mean, when I do a fire risk assessment, I have a, a fire door audit that goes with that, and I have a compartmentalisation audit. I don't know whether anybody's seen the, the local, the, the recent guidance on the Association of Specialist Fire Protections on passive fire protection. It's in a guidance format from Niall Rowan, but in the back of there, Niall's actually used some of the, the um, stuff that I, I spoke with him about in auditing of the compartmentation. It's a good document. Have a look at it if you haven't seen it. If anybody wants to, I'm sure through um, through Inside House, and we can give you the link to where that document can be found. Um, yeah, absolutely. Happy to put that up. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> um, so so use that. The the fire door auditing document I've got, I'm quite happy to, to send that through fire risk uh, advisors who are sponsoring this um, so that, uh, again, you guys can have a link into that. And so what the first protocol, what we did is we went around and we've measured the gaps around all of the doors and we've looked at what the furniture on the doors is. We've looked at the the, the, the uh, intermittent seals and the smoke seals where required and we've got that data and we can actually then look at that across a spreadsheet and have a look where the issues are and where we're going to spend the money and then we sat down with the brigade and said look these are our issues these are the properties that we've got we're starting with the uh, protected stairways we're starting with the um, uh, the riser cupboards and, and things of that ilk. And we'll move on to front doors, where front doors have been, you know, seriously, obviously needing changing, and we're putting them in. As far as leaseholders are concerned, one of the things when you are putting a door program in, 
why not offer the leaseholders the opportunity to benefit? Well, the, well you've got people in there, people like Fire Door Risk Advisors get in there and do it. They can actually offer them to do a, a special deal while they're there as well. So they get a benefit from you actually putting the programme of works in. Uh, everybody works and, and you know then that that door is going to work in the event of a fire. Great. And, and uh, just uh, to, uh, to, to let everybody know, I mean, I'll, I'll take a couple more questions and then we'll start to, to, to round things up. Um, so uh, anybody uh, um, who, who has a question that they don't, don't think has been answered or, or um, desperately want to get get to answered, if you can um, um, uh, post them now, uh, that that'll be great. Um, and obviously I'm aware that there's been um, pretty healthy debates going on in the chat section as well, so I, hopefully a lot of the questions are getting answered. As Martin, we're speaking, Martin, somebody, somebody's just dropped in the link for the um, for the document. David, oh, uh, so yeah, okay. So that's in the chat section. So um, apparently, it's asfp.org.uk dot yeah. uk um, is the, um, the, the the place to go to. If anybody's got any problems with that link, then um, if yes, they can post and we can um, uh, double check it. But um, yeah, it's asfp dot org dot uk um so um again in a, in a few minutes what i'll probably do is, uh, is ask everybody just for their closing thoughts but um uh, we, we there have been a good number of questions about sheltered blocks um which which have been um discussed and um uh, in, in the chat section but um yeah i just 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 want to raise that with 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 um the panelists um a good good number of questions um about um uh, i think started with questions about residents in sheltered blocks that have problems opening fire doors um, are there any recommended solutions for them um, uh, there was a guy uh, Michael Pusley I think who asked um, is a stay put policy acceptable for elderly people in sheltered housing um, presumably bearing in mind some of those issues um, so um, yeah but, uh, Michael I don't know whether you, uh, that's an issue that's particularly affected you if, if um, the stay put policies no I think it's I'm, I've, I've never come across a shelter scheme really that hasn't got one no, that's that's that's, that's fair. I, it, it just seems like uh, so. It, sorry. I was just going to say, purely because of the mobility of the customers and the the inherent risks of trying to get elderly customers to move potentially in the middle of the night through the building um, and putting themselves in more harm. I just just in terms of that, because uh, certainly that first question seemed to be about um, the, the doors themselves. I mean, is it, is it just uh, um, uh, 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 that some of them, uh, some of the residents have problems opening the doors? I, I'm not. I, I, I wonder whether the background implication is that that, that um, some of the residents are propping open those doors again um, because because of those those problems. So I, I just wonder practically whether there's, the, there's any way you can go about work, certainly working with residents in sheltered schemes to to, to address that kind of um, yeah, one thing we was involved in last year and did um, a number of long schemes. Um, same issues, corridor doors, fire doors being quite heavy um, for residents, and especially residents that have got walking aids, um, was we installed a number of magnetic door holders that were linked to the fire alarms. Um, so during the day, the doors could be left opened so the residents had mobility through the the schemes yeah. and if there was an issue and the fire alarm goes off those doors will automatically close yeah, uh, yeah, so it's kind of a balance there it's not the cheapest thing to install the other option which is a bit more expensive again is putting automatic door owners on the internal corridors uh, but again that financially that's quite prohibitive um, due, due to the high cost of installing all the individual doors and the sheer number of doors in some of our sheltered schemes. We, well, what we might do is come back to that that issue in terms of because um, uh, there have been a, a one or two questions about cost. Um, so I, I think more generally, um, but but we can um, um, perhaps come back to that and touch on both those issues. But very quickly, I'll, I'll ask um, Nick Coombe if, if that's okay. Um, again, just just in terms of specific issues with regards to shelter block sheltered schemes, and um, uh, again, there does seem to be some um, uh, confusion about exa exactly. Um, how landlords should approach um, fire safety in, in, in blocks and how that should differ from, um, say, a high-rise. I think um, 
I think with sheltered housing is that you know it's 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 more about the vulnerability of the resident. I think what you're finding. I mean, in answer to the first question about the door closers, yeah, there are some devices on the market. Obviously, I can't recommend devices, but there are some out there that will assist with that. Um, secondly, what we've got, you know, with sheltered housing is the people that are using sheltered housing has, has dramatically changed. I think over the last few years, that in a, in a kind of pecking order, the people that were in hospital years ago, you know, what I would call, you know, uh, who needed full 24-hour care, are now being pushed out into residential care homes. Those that were in the residential care home are now moving out into sheltered housing, so they still require some kind of care while they're in there, whereas our vision of sheltered housing is normally someone who needs a little bit of hand with a shopping, etc., but are normally mobile and normal. But that isn't the case now in sheltered housing. Plus, with the removal of wardens, because of the fact that for cost-saving exercise, you do have some issues with sheltered housing. What I would say is it's about having a, a competent person undertake a risk assessment who has done them kind of uh, uh, premises before. I think, as, as, as uh, Nick, I think it was Nick or Mike said before, uh, stay put policy is really the only suitable strategy for sheltered housing nowadays, and therefore the premises has to try and meet that, or maybe additional control measures will have to be put in to make that strategy uh, reliable. And just sorry, I mean, you mentioned the removal of wardens there. Um, what issues has that raised? Um, I mean, I, I guess some, some of them are, are reasonably straightforward, but um, what, what issues has that raised and, and how have, have landlords um, sought to address those? I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that, that they have in some cases. Obviously, the, the warden was there Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, and in most cases lived on site, which gave that additional support when they when they you know, pulled their link line. Now it goes straight to a, an alarm receiving centre who, who are not knowledgeable about the person or the, the type of premises, which I think has not always been addressed in the, in the risk assessment, you know, because again, going back to the type of people that are there and the way that premises is now being used. So, so, so really something that, that landlords um, perhaps should be, um, if, if, they, if they haven't thought about it, um, should be going away and, and having a look at it if, if they've been removing yeah, wardens. Yeah, yeah, I would like to say it's not, it's not the Fire and Rescue Service's job to say whether people have wardens or, or not, and I understand the, the way the economy is at the moment about people trying to cut costs. I think whenever they make some kind of decision like that, they need to take into account their fire risk assessment so it still remains suitable and sufficient, and that's all as an enforcing authority we can ask for. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, thanks for that. And um, just, so just, just, just. Can I just come in with a comment now? It's probably yeah. On sheltered housing, on what's probably a, a big risk that I think a lot of landlords are coming up against, and a lot are, are unsure how to address. And I'm not intending giving an answer on that, but it's around sheltered housing and mobility scooters and the inherent fire risk that they present in sheltered housing schemes in terms of the fire risk of them being actually hazards in corridors for um, and are being yeah. charged and, and also the, the fact that they're blocking ingress from buildings in a number of cases. Uh, and it's an ever-growing number of our sheltered residents who are looking to quite rightly increase their mobility through um, use the use of mobility scooters, and we've got um, a whole, you know, the majority of our sheltered housing stock across the country isn't designed to allow access to the buildings through these scooters and allow adequate storage and the correct safe areas for, the, for them to be charged. And I think that's something that we all need to probably start some bigger discussions around and and look at how we put some collective solutions to that as well. Got you. And um, yeah, it's just just a question uh, literally just popped um, popped up, which will take us, um, I guess, the last last question I um, I'll, I'll deal with. Um, uh, today. Um, so it's, it's the issue of cost. I mean, uh, Louise Hughes has just said, if I understand right, Michael Vickers has said LMH are fitting self-closing doors to alleviate the issue of propping doors open or removing the self-closing device, um, but at what cost? And there's, there's been a few questions about cost, and, and I don't know whether we can move on to this issue more wi widely. Um, obviously, a, 
um, a concern to landlords. I know certainly from the dialogue I've had with landlords over the last last year or so, um, and and the fire brigade, um, a, an area of discussion between the the two. I think um, 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 in terms of um, uh, you know their ability to address some of these issues, how much it's going to cost, what's what's the best way of doing it. Um, um, uh, keeping residents safe and uh, obviously minimising the cost to, to landlords. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think Graham Inns um, asked some questions about that, that earlier as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, Graham, whether you want to um, kick, kick off with that. Uh, just, just before you do, though, there's been, there's been a, a couple of qu uh, practical questions which have just come up. If, if uh, I don't I'll know if people can answer them online, um, that, 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 that would be perfect, um, just, just, to, just to make sure we cover as much as possible before we um, um, close today. Um, so, yeah, just, just last question about, about cost, and then I'll ask the panel to round, uh, round off. Um, yeah, no, no, obviously, uh, you know, the health and safety legislation generally looks at things as to whether it has to be done whether it's uh, as far as is reasonably practicable as practicable. So we have to look at them in those, those settings. I'm a fully qualified health and safety professional. It's not just fire I deal with. But you have to look at those in those things. Um, and it's not unrealistic. And that's why it's really important to engage with the fire brigade because we've engaged with them. We've told them what we've got to spend. We've told them what we're, what, what we're attacking first in, in what, we'd, what we'd like to do. And we've... we've by doing that, we've got them on side. We've got them working with us. So we've not got the fear hanging over our head that if something goes wrong, we're going to get, to, we're going to get charged by the fire brigade because they know that we're doing everything reasonably practical to get these things and to address these issues. Um, somebody was asking about fire doors earlier on in converted houses, uh, just a, sort of a point that uh, HMOs yeah. require the, the fire doors in, in all of the uh, bedrooms. Fire doors uh, within a converted house, what we're talking about there before, was purely and simply a, a house that's been converted into two flats. So the flats are still their own private residence, but their front door and that little space at the front would be, would be there, part of the uh, uh, requirements of the RRO, because that would be communal space. Uh, and there was somebody asked a very quick question on capping off of gas. Yeah, um, because we've moved away from the gas. From that. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I, I, think yeah, the, no, no, I think the question I would ask them is: Is the gas meter been capped off before the meter, or is it, are we talking about capping it off after the meter? Because prior to the meter, it's Transco's uh, responsibility. Um, after the meter, it's, the, it's then the landlord's responsibility. Um, so perhaps if they want to come back, I don't know whether we'll get opportunities to review these questions and give people more detailed answers. Well, I, th I think if, if people are happy to stay online for a bit and answer some of the questions that, that, that haven't been answered, that, that, that would be great. I think we can leave it running for a few minutes. But, um, yeah, I, th I think we'll, we'll, we'll round off very, very shortly. Um, just, to, just because that question of cost was, um, was fired at, at Michael, um, I don't know whether he, he's got anything he wants to, 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 to say about that, um, if, if that's okay. Um, and then, and then, then we'll move to rounding off, I think. Sorry, which, which, sorry, 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 Michael. It's, yeah, ju it's just in terms of. Um, uh, I mean, it was a very specific question you had about um, um, the, the self-closing doors, um, fitting self-closing yeah. doors, and the cost. But, but I, I think more generally speaking, I mean, yeah, the, 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 the balance between cost and um, um, yeah, uh, you know, I think the self-closing doors it, it hits two categories. It's not just about fire safety. It also kicks into um, DDA or accessibility um, for customers. So I know uh, I've dealt with it before. It's been we've actually been looking at it probably initially when we installed the door the door closures. Um, we or the, the magnetic um, openers. We installed them as 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 much as part of the accessibility to the scheme for customers as we did for fire. Um, and it was part of the same thing. And I think the the difficulty with the cost is. You know they're not they're not particularly cheap. I can't actually remember the cost of per unit. However, when we're looking through schemes and we're looking to upgrade the fire um, detection systems in schemes, then it becomes much more affordable to include them within that upgrade. And, and that's again what we've done previously is included within the specification for upgrades that that would be included and then it can, becomes much more affordable rather than one-off. The other thing that you'll potentially find as well in terms of the, the door owners is that 
probably more and more will come through as part of um, OT adaptations for customers that have mobility issues and can't open doors and require them to have automatic openers. And again, it's a cost that landlords are just going to have to 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 understand for their schemes and um, and, and actually, you know, plan for in the future. Great. No, no. Um, cheers, Michael. And uh, I, I realise we're uh, approaching one, so if I can just um, very, very quickly go round um, the panel and, and just ask them for perhaps closing thoughts um, from um, you know all, all the questions and the discussions we've we, um, the discussion we've had um, to, today, and I'll um, uh, start with Nick, if that's okay. Um, just you know, just in terms of uh, a few closing thoughts. Yeah, just to try and reiterate that the, the Fire and Rescue Service uh, do use enforcement uh, as, as a tool, but we would much rather work with people and try and, and, and rectify faults in, in, in meaningful dialogue. So I would encourage you all to talk to your local Fire and Rescue Service and try and achieve compliance that way. Great. And um, Nick, Nick Cross, again, um, closing thoughts, if, if, um, if you wouldn't mind. I mean, I think it just echoed Nick's comment, to be honest. I mean, the, we've got a good track record here of working closely in partnership with our local fire brigade, and I think that's proved dividends. I mean, I think the, uh, the other message I would say, which I came up with one of the other speakers earlier, was, you know, you know, do you challenge the fire service to, to, to justify um, some of the requirements they might make? There is sometimes a, uh, in, in reaction to an incident, there is sometimes a risk to uh, that the requirements will go over, overboard. To be reasonable, be proportionate, can balance the risk, um, and you know just to touch on the issue of cost. I mean, in, you know, and again to reiterate the point I made earlier, you know, the cost of us dealing with a major incident of the tower block was around in several hundreds of thousands of pounds. Um, yeah. Actually, the cost of putting right some of the small items identified in the risk assessment was a few single thousands of pounds. So in the scheme of things, it's far better to be proactive and preventative rather than uh, reactive and respond to major incidents. Uh, yes, I think that's def definitely something for, for people to think about. And my, Michael, again, if, if you wouldn't mind just, just closing with some um, um, final thoughts. Yeah, I think along the fire, I mean, very much about what's been agreed with what's been said. And I think for me, for any organisation, it's about, it's about understanding what the risks are because until you do that, until you understand what risks you're exposed to and your customers are exposed to, you can't then deal with them. Once you understand them, it's about working with all the partners involved to plan to reduce as much as reasonably possible um, the risks to your customers and to the properties. And again, with the, with the gas, which I know we've not talked about much here, but was part of yep. this. On the gas, I think very much the summary there is is to um, is about education and and the use of technology. I think one of the big ways forward now with gas is to use the uh, service interrupters, and that should see all landlords being able to achieve very high um, access percentages and significantly reduce the risks then on any accidents with gas services. Great. Th thanks, Michael. And, um, and Graham, if you, if you wouldn't mind just rounding off. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, the, I think the, the key thing is to actually have a look at uh, what do you really want your fire protection to do first and foremost, and that is to save lives. So let's look at the things that are going to kill people, your smoke control around the building. There, there's your first, first point of call. How are people going to get out of the building? What information you can give to the brigade? There's some quick wins, some not, not costly wins, and I'd reiterate very strongly what was said about the fact that let's work with the fire brigade. They're quite happy to work with you. They're quite happy to do um, things to assist and help you. I've written a few different documents that I've mentioned today, and there's a few other bits of information. I've written some uh, different uh, guidance for, 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 for the organizations I've already done work with. Um, I'm not interested in making money from it. I'm more than happy if anybody wants to get that and plagiarise the stuff that I've done. I'm more than happy for them to have it. I'm sure they can contact through yourselves to get my, de my, my details and send it out. I'll send it out to you. It's not a problem. I, you know, I, I, if, if what we can do here in this forum today saves a couple of people's lives this year and next year, then everything is worthwhile. 
Yeah, I think that's a, a, a fine um, sentiment to, to, to round off on. Um, th thanks very much, um, Graham. And um, actually, just just very quickly, because I know um, that there's uh, oh, Mike, Michael's already answered the question. I, th I think so. Um, cheer, cheer, cheers, that Michael. There's, there's a, a question that just popped up following his and closing statements. So all, all that remains for, for me to do is um, to thank um, the panelists today: uh, Nick Coombe from London Fire Brigade, Nick Cross from S uh, Southampton City Council. Michael Vickers from Liverpool Mutual Homes and Graham Fieldhouse, uh, consultant specialising in fire safety. Um, thank you very much and I really appreciate um, um, all, all the questions you've answered today and um, staying an extra ha half an hour to, to cram as much in as possible. Um, thank you all very much. Cheers.